I'll introduce them, and I'll, while they're getting seated, I think we'll let each of them speak between three and five minutes on an overview. Then we'll have questions. We have our, raise your hand, City Club, City Club person. There she is, raise their hands. You raise your hand and uh, they'll pick the questions up. We already have some. Shows you how important this session is. We have questions before they talk. Uh, so I hope you cover this. So in reading from my, down the row, we'll be starting with Lawrence and then through him. We have Lawrence Massal, president of the Civic Federation, been here a lot. You may have seen him on television 30 or 40 times in the last week, uh, <laughs> testifying, putting out very excellent uh, analyses. And Lawrence is uh, uh, probably one of the leading experts on this entire topic. Good friend of ours. We don't even need you people. We got all these questions all the time. Uh, give him a round of applause. Now we have two new people, and I will read their resume somewhat. Matt Fabian, partner, municipal market analytics, or as we like to call it, the MMA. Um, uh, all kinds of very important stuff. Oh, yeah. Has been chairman of the Municipal <laughs> Analyst Group of New York, otherwise known as MAGNE. Is also on the Board of Governors of the National Federation of Municipal Analysts and a lot of other stuff like that. Uh, has his degree from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University and in academic circles, that's uh, sort of playing in the big league. Give him a big round of applause, Matt. And, and last but not least, we have Rachel Cortez, Vice President, U.S. Public Finance Group, Moody's Investor Service. You may have heard they've been in the news lately. Um, <laughs> Rachel is Vice President with the U.S. Public Finance Group of Moody's Investor Services, Co-Manager of Moody's Chicago Office, and Rachel oversees local government credits in Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, and Wisconsin. How about a round of applause for uh, Rachel? And Rachel also uh, is a, has an, uh, an MA from, MPA from the Syracuse uh, Maxwell School of Business. Uh, or Maxwell School of Public Is Administration. Uh, I've been teaching public administration for over 30 years. You'd think I'd catch it. And last but not least, we did invite someone from the city to, uh, to participate. Uh, they refused to uh, attend. Uh, <laughs> Is that polite enough, Jay? Good enough. Uh, they declined. All right, so Lawrence, since you're the veteran, why don't you start off with an overview, five minutes, and uh, I'm keeping time. Lawrence Massal. Thank you, Paul, for that always um, interesting introduction. Consistent, <laughs> isn't it? It's always consistent. For those of you no longer getting the newspapers at home, the city of Chicago is in bad financial shape. And the city's been in bad financial shape for quite some time. A couple people talked to me beforehand and were saying, you know, how does it feel that the Civic Federation has been out there warning about what could happen, warning about the failure to tie our um, pension funds to an actuarial sound method of funding. And I think it feels the same way for me that it should feel for all of you. It feels very uncomfortable. The city of Chicago is the economic engine of our state. It is the place all of us call home. And to, it was inconceivable for me and for the, my colleagues at the Civic Federation um, that five years ago, three years ago, that we would be looking at a city that is now rated as what is called junk bonds or non-investment grade. It's a terrible place to be, and it's been driven by a lot of long-term bad decisions that were made, some in Springfield, some in Chicago, and some without people fully recognizing what the consequences for those decisions would be. But many of them were known to our elected officials to our um, various city council, general assembly, or the information was there. It still doesn't provide any real satisfaction and it's not that instructive to focus on who didn't do what when they didn't do it. A bigger question and the most important question I think for today is where does the city of Chicago go from here? How do we stabilize our city's finances? How do we make sure that the city we love, that we depend on, that all of us 
at the Civic Federation, all of you as members of the City Club really want to see our city prosper. The city has had a long history of borrowing for operating expenses. Over the last th three years, the uh, Emanuel administration has worked to reduce the level of borrowing for operating, but has not eliminated it. The city has had a practice of what is called scoop and toss, where basically instead of paying off our debt when it comes due, the principal payment is not made. Instead, it is refinanced and pushed out to a later term, which makes it enormous, enormously more expensive and also means that we're paying twice again for whatever we received from that initial um, bond offering. Uh, Mayor Daley um, did a lot of great things for the city of Chicago. I think you can walk around the city and you can't help. Uh, if you look at pictures from before his administration and after, you look at things such as Millennium Park, the vibrancy of downtown, all those things are a great credit to the mayor. The mayor used some innovative financing, right? He, was, he led the nation, right, with one where the Skyway was uh, privatized. And the Civic Federation strongly supported the privatization of the Skyway. We weren't that good at operating our one toll booth um, in the city of Chicago, and the bonds had been in trouble. And so when um, the city offered it up and the private investors came in to take it over, it made a lot of financial sense. Unfortunately, we didn't use all the money that we, from that asset sale. We used a lot of it, certainly to pay down the existing debt, but, and we set up some reserve funds, which were quickly um, tapped into to prop up the operating expense rather than structurally improving the city's um, debt structure or funding the grossly underfunded pensions. The other asset sales, because um, I think it's important to put them in context, was the parking garages at Grant, under Grant Park. Those were also innovative ideas that were um, and provided great financial benefit to the city of Chicago. The city of Chicago was not good at operating pro uh, parking garages either. They were competing with the private sector and it, was, it had proven to be quite a challenge. So the decision to privatize, to um, um, let the private sector run those garages had a great financial benefit, both to the Chicago Park District, which also participated. And then there was the parking meters. And if you walk around the city or if you try to find a parking space in the city of Chicago, we're all benefiting from the investment that was made in our parking meters. You can pay for your parking. You can find parking for one downtown and pay for it with a credit card. Now, granted, the price is quite considerably higher than it was previous, but the, the real problem with the parking meter privatization was we didn't use the money to basically make sure that we were improving our long-term financial position. We sold an asset. We turned over control over those parking spaces to a private um, entity and now we're going to be, be under the influence of that organization um, for many years to come. And it was not bad, and it was poorly, well, it was a good idea. It, it delivered on what it was supposed to do in terms of the city council was never going to find the political strength, in my opinion, to raise parking meters to a level that really matched the market rates. But it wasn't, but the actual execution of the agreement and the contract and who's responsible for what and what does the city need to do with a parking space when they need to have road construction or who pays when it's made a handicap space, all of those things were not well um, articulated in the city's um, interest. And so as a result, there's enormous distaste now, not just for parking meter privatization, but any privatization or alternative service deliveries that are offered. And that's a shame because when you're the worst rated credit of any municipality in the United States, um, with the exception of, of course, Detroit, which has already filed for bankruptcy, um, you need every option available. Close it off, though. So I, the last thing I would say is this, even with the downgrade from Moody's, which is now less than investment grade, the city is not bankrupt. The city is not for, it's not a foregone conclusion that the city is going to be filing for bankruptcy. The Civic Federation does not believe that direct bankruptcy is the answer for the city of Chicago or any other governments. We need the state of Illinois to step in, take on, not bail out the city of Chicago, but uncuff the city of Chicago. The pension funding crisis was created by our state legislature. The pension benefits were created by our state legislature. They can only be resolved even with the Supreme Court decision um, of last week, there are things that the state can do to provide a great deal of stabilization both to the city and the state of Illinois. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Lawrence, and thank you for leaving on a little bit of a high note. Give a round of applause. <laughs> Matt, you're up. Thank you very much. Um, just to introduce myself and my firm, uh, MMA, Municipal Market Analytics, we're an independent research firm. So we are fairly unique in the municipal bond world. We just uh, write research, we sell newsletters, um, and our subscribers are, you know, for the most part, 80% uh, or so institutional participants in the, in the bond market, bond, bond dealers, underwriters, uh, and also the big buyers, the mutual funds, the hedge funds, and that, and that sort of thing. And so in that, you know, and, and we don't buy or sell any securities, just, uh, you know, there's no trading, it's just research. But in this kind of job where we are trying to maintain um, opinions and to help people think through issues, you know, we spend uh, really 100% of our, of our working hours uh, living and breathing uh, the municipal bond market, right? So that's what we think about, you know, it's, which is different than policy um, because, you know, sometimes there are, you know, I, I, I get asked about, well, what should a city do or, or this and that. And it's not, you know, for me, not necessarily about the shoulds. You know, I'm more about what, what the market might, might do. And, you know, one thing that I've learned uh, about the municipal bond market, which I think is extremely relevant in Chicago's case, uh, is that, you know, this is, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, the people who uh, lend in the municipal bond market, the investors, are, uh, for the most part, individuals, right? They're like, they are dentists, they're your doctors. Um, you know, they are the ones lending. Uh, non-professionals, right, as opposed to in the corporate bond market where you have professional investors, hedge funds, and the like, who are driving a lot of the decisions. Uh, on the borrower side, the issuers, you have 50 or 60,000 discrete individual issuers, 1.2 million individual securities, each one structured in a very customized way uh, under specific state laws and sort of the political and economic realities of their jurisdiction. So it's an incredibly complex, um, you, you, would, you might argue the most complex financial market in America, um, being funded by the least sophisticated investors. So how does that work? That works on trust, right? <laughs> Fundamentally, that works on trust, where for the most part, municipal bonds don't default. The current default rate is 0.4%. So you have, um, a, you have, so that is why a city like Chicago or a place like Puerto Rico uh, or Detroit can get themselves into um, worlds of economic difficulty and financial difficulty through their borrowing without the bond market, you know, making much fuss. You know, for the most part, the bond market funds loans. We don't prescribe policy. Uh, so the situation as it is, it, it, we, this is the situation as it has been for Chicago up, up to this point. Uh, I'd say that we are nearing a, a crucial uh, 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 pivot in the market's uh, continued tolerance of, of what Chicago um, uh, uh, does on the policy side. You know, the big driver here is probably Detroit, right? In a large sense, Chicago is paying Detroit's bills. Um, Detroit showed the, that uh, uh, financial lenders in the market that things can go much more poorly than we expect, right? That trust isn't always a two-way street and that issuers in, um, in extreme financial difficulty can become adversarial, um, whereas, you know, like, um, you know, in the introduction, right, we came in, uh, you know, Rachel and I were both from the Maxwell School, and, you know, investors in the municipal bond market tend to come at it thinking of ourselves in a partnership with the borrowers to finance infrastructure together. This, the example of Detroit puts that in jeopardy, and I think that now is a crucial time for the city. You know, Chicago, different than other places, right? Chicago, is, Chicago and Illinois, in a large sense, if you think about, say, New Jersey, right? New Jersey taxes an exceptionally uh, high rate across all of its lines, income sales, um, uh, property taxes, but yet spends way more than it should, right? So that's their problem. California uh, has an extremely volatile tax system, right, where, it, where sometimes it, it generates um, an, an abundance, right? Like right now, every month, California, uh, there, uh, uh, on average, about an extra billion dollars is showing up in the mail every month for California. Um, not a bad problem to have now, but when times are rough, they get really tough. Uh, Detroit just ran out of revenue. It taxed as much as it possibly could, continually instituting new taxes, but each one, because of, of the economic devastation of that city, was gradually insufficient, and therefore, otherwise moderate uh, um, uh, spending targets, like, you know, their pensions really weren't that bad. Their debt was really minimal. But even those moderate costs became unaffordable because the revenue decline was so severe. 
Chicago and Illinois, um, for the most part, it's about the revenue side, that, that, that the state and the city have not taxed to the extent that others have. And consequently, the, their expenditure burdens you know, look more painful and are more difficult for them to balance. Going forward, the market is for sure you know, signaled by you know, Moody's, uh, you know, maybe as the first, and maybe, maybe more to come, who knows. But I think that going forward, the market is looking for, um, um, you know, for sure, some kind of management plan. You know, bankruptcy, right, as, as, as has been discussed, that's a very short-term plan, right? That's trying to fix everything and swing for the fences now. The problems of Chicago and Illinois are much bigger than that and are going to take much more time, you know, gradually over years. Um, and the market is ready to participate and to go along with that um, because there is still broad tolerance and a broad interest in lending, but that there has to be something proactive, right, that, 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 that comes out of you know, the fiscal 16 budget and out of the current crisis. So that's what we're, that's what we're looking for. I think that's the... That is, that is the way forward um, for the city, at least as far as the municipal bond market's concerned. Thank you very much, Matt. Now, a round of applause. <laughs> uh, Rachel, you're up next, and I want you to know of the five questions I have, you're running, you're running the table. So uh, <laughs> people are going to be very interested in what you have to say. Go ahead, you have, Okay. Can I go? <laughs> <laughs> Cowards die many times before their death. There you go. The valiant taste death but once. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I'll just start off by telling everyone a bit about Moody's itself and what our role is and what a credit rating is. Uh, Moody's Investor Service was established in 1909. We provide independent credit ratings and other independent objective um, forms of analysis on debt issued by corporations, governments, and other um, types of entities. We provide one opinion, just one voice of many that investors can use to make their decisions. Um, we don't recommend anything to investors. We don't recommend anything to issuers. And this is a pretty subtle but important point. Um, you know, we don't um, advise issuers on taxing decisions, on expenditure reductions, on how to fund their pensions, on how to solve their problems. So, um, you know, it's very, very important that our role in the marketplace is just an independent objective assessment. We provide that assessment through the lens of our published, publicly available methodologies. And for the city of Chicago, our rating is based on our general obligation rating methodology. Um, I'm here today with a few of my colleagues. I want to just um, point them out because they do a lot of the work on analyzing the city's credits along with me. Uh, Matt Butler is the lead analyst for the City of Chicago, and Tom Aaron is the um, is part of our team that we have dedicated to analyzing U.S. public pensions at Moody's. So, just wanted to uh, acknowledge them. So, as you might imagine, we've gotten quite a few questions over the past few days about our rating action on Chicago. If you um, you may have noticed on the on the table as you checked in, I have a publication that I've brought with me, frequently asked questions on our rating action on Chicago. If there aren't copies left, I've also left my business card there, so please feel free to reach out to me um, and I can send you a copy of that publication. But I'll just go through a few of those questions um, right now for you. The first question that we've gotten is, why did Moody's take rating action on Chicago when the Supreme Court decision was on the state's pension plans and not the city? And the answer is because our rating action was based not on the Illinois Supreme Court decision itself, but on the implications of that decision as we view it for Chicago. Um, the city has two options for reducing its unfunded pension liabilities, reducing benefits paid from the plans or increasing contributions paid by the city into those plans. And our read of the Supreme Court decision is that it all but removes that first option for Chicago. We, um, we expected that the Supreme Court decision might um, be one that reversed the state's reforms. But we didn't know for sure until May 8th how the Supreme Court would act. And we also didn't know specifically how they would express their opinion. For example, the opinion could have been expressed in a way that provided a roadmap for reform. But 
To us, it was pretty clear that benefit reductions under any circumstance are impermissible and in violation of the Illinois Constitution. So we've been asked, well, why not downgrade the state of Illinois? Why Chicago? And the answer there is that Chicago is in a much more precarious place than Illinois is with respect to its pensions. Illinois, by GASB projections, their pensions would reach um, depletion by 2066. Uh, Chicago's pension plans, the four pension plans, municipal, laborer, police, and fire, under various projections and various assumptions, they are projected to reach insolvency within the next decade. So Chicago is in a much more precarious position when it comes to pensions. And the second reason that we took action on Chicago, but not Illinois, is because Illinois has a lot more tools in its tool chest than Chicago does. Illinois has a very, very broad base of revenue raising options, a lot of powers afforded to them, and they also have a lot of tools on the expenditure side that Chicago doesn't. One of those tools that Illinois has is they can push their problems on down to underlying units of local governments. So for example, shifting funding uh, to, for the pension plans of all school districts in the state other than CPS, that's an option that's um, been talked about for years. That's something that the uh, state could do and we'll be watching to see if in fact they do do that. That would be credit negative for the affected entities, but it could uh, help Illinois solve its budget problems. Again, we don't make any recommendations. We're not advising the state or the city or the school districts what they should or shouldn't do. We're just commenting on the, the options that are available. A third question that we've gotten is, why does Moody's focus so heavily on Chicago's pensions? Shouldn't the strength of the economy and the city's ability to raise revenue counterbalance the severity of the pension challenges? And, you know, again, I would point to our general obligation rating methodology and how we look at Chicago's general obligation debt. We look at about 7,000 uh, local governments through this methodology, and we compare how Chicago uh, looks on a number of key metrics to those uh, local governments. And, you know, we look at our adjusted net pension liability figure for Chicago, and we compare that to operating revenues for the city. For the city, that metric is, they are number one out of all of the U.S. local governments that we look at. That ratio of pensions to operating revenues is the highest of any U.S. local government that we look at. And it's true that the tax base is very broad. Um, the, the ability to raise property taxes and sales taxes is pretty, pretty uh, strong, given the fact that the city is a home rule unit of local government. But, um, you know, when you compare the size of the liabilities, not just pensions, but bonded debt, and you look at the debt of not just the city, but of the overlapping units of local government, so Chicago Public Schools, Chicago Park District, um, proportionate shares of Cook County, Matt Water, Cook County Forest Preserve. When you look at all of the debt and unfunded pension liabilities that a city taxpayer is responsible for, that number is very large relative to the other U.S. local governments that we rate. So just to give a sense of the scale of Chicago's liabilities, um, I'll compare this number here to a few other cities. The overall debt and adjusted net pension liabilities for Chicago per capita is 26,000. For New York, that number is 18,000. For Philadelphia, it's 11,000. And for Detroit, it's $13,000. So again, Chicago is twice as large um, as, um, almost twice as large on a per capita basis as Detroit when we're looking at overall debt and unfunded pension liabilities. Rachel, thank you. Round, ha, round of applause. Uh, okay, uh, very, very well done and uh, uh, very instructive. You, by the way, you, Jay, you can watch this whole thing on our, our web page, website, right? Live streaming. Live streaming, but also they can get it afterwards, yeah, because uh, I like to be taking notes. Well, we have a series of questions and uh, Rachel, you take a, take a breath for a second because as I said, you're very uh, popular. Uh, <laughs> this is from the Honorable Don Heider. Uh, nicely typed. By, by the way, some of you asked questions uh, 
We want questions, not master's thesis. So just so, go on. Uh, here we go. Uh, this, on the city finances, uh, what New York's other cities, what New York City uh, was near Muni uh, bankruptcy in Detroit, largest bankruptcy have in common is that the financial resolution resulted from cross-sector leadership. New York City had it with Kerry, Koch, uh, Roten, Rockefeller, and uh, a labor guy. Detroit, the, the, the Magnificent Seven, hmm, uh, a whole bunch of people. The question is, and let uh, Matt or, uh, or Lawrence uh, jump in on this one, what is Chicago, uh, or what is the Illinois Chicago leadership coming from? Are we putting together the same kind of team that Detroit and New York did to get out of their mess, or to try and get out of their mess in the case of Detroit? Matt? Well, I mean, I would say that Detroit is not necessarily out of their mess. Well, what, what Detroit has done through the bankruptcy is basically give the city 10 years of breathing room by reducing liabilities and, and with the hope that revenues begin to grow um, by that point. Right? If they don't, the city could well be back in bankruptcy. Uh, so I don't necessarily say that Detroit has been fixed uh, in, any, in any broad uh, sense. Uh, the, my, my experience with uh, Chicago politics specifically is uh, more limited than uh, these guys, uh, but I'd say that from the outside, looking in, it does not appear uh, uh, that, that there has been um, the growth of any kind of broad coalition of stakeholders, which, I mean, maybe that is part of the uh, fiscal 16 budget process that is still to come, um, but there is, you know, again, this expectation that something will happen. I, I don't know that I've seen evidence of it uh, yet, at least from Connecticut where I'm based. Lawrence, you want to jump in on that? Yes, I, I would say Chicago, and this club is a perfect example, right? Has a long history of civic pulling together, the business, labor, um, not-for-profit community pulling together in a crisis. So I don't think we're, we, uh, we are not at the point of Detroit, and we're far from it. New York, I think, is a, is a good example. You have to go back 30 years, 40 years, to look at it, there's some distinctive differences which are also um, interesting and a little bit frightening. When New York got into so much trouble, um, the state of New York was not anywhere near the financial condition of the state of Illinois is right now. And it was when the, the mayor of New York went to um, Washington in the famous post headline where Gerald Ford told him to drop dead, basically is what the headline was when they asked for a federal bailout is, um, I think, instructive because I don't think you're going to, you, you'd probably get the same reaction now from our federal government. So in terms of, can, is there a, the potential to put a team together? Definitely. Has, and I think the mayor, um, Mayor Emanuel, has done a lot of good things to bring um, labor together in terms of this. His negotiation of the pension reforms and his team's negotiation on the pension reforms that were passed by the legislature, which are a distinct legal, uh, um, they, will, they will be offering distinctively different legal arguments before the Circuit Court of Cook County as opposed to the Circuit Court of Sangamon County. Um, where Senate Bill 1 started, which was the state reforms. But it, there'll be distinct argument. The potential um, in the mayor has been strong in um, pointing out that they believe because they negotiated with the unions in terms of getting them to agree on the legislation before they went to Springfield, that they have a better chance of it being upheld in the courts. But the, the, the real um, bonus for Chicago is not just that we have a, a strong mayor, but that we have a robust business community that understands how significant this is. The question is, can we get Springfield to understand how significant this is, in my opinion? Having just been in Springfield yesterday afternoon to return there tomorrow morning, let me tell you that um, it's a, the sense of urgency, the awareness of the crisis that is a shared crisis is not as clear as you would have expected based on the news um, about Chicago, Chicago Public Schools and the Park District's downgrade. We cannot allow our elected state representatives and uh, senators and um, the governor to think that we can fix the state's budget on paper and allow the city of Chicago, in particular the Chicago Public Schools, to swing in the wind and think that, that we're gonna, we can call that victory. The biggest immediate challenge for the city will be what do, in addition to um, managing the debt and managing its continued need to go to the market 
now more than ever because of the downgrade in terms of um, the, uh, the, the triggers that that sets off. But how do we get the Chicago Public Schools open with a billion dollar budget deficit, of which 700 million of that is pension um, contribution for the coming year with the Supreme Court ruling? There needs to be a very big answer and a big part of it, it has to come from Springfield. The Civic Federation believes there's really no policy justification for why the Chicago Public School teachers' pension system is treated differently than all the other school districts. The state of Illinois created this underfunding. They created the benefits. It would be a, a, a pretty clean opportunity to take the pension system back, give it to the state of Illinois, which would free up the school district in Chicago to focus on its other operating expenses. Okay. Yeah, as you know, the moderator never butts in, right? I mean, you're all here. Uh, that would have little chance of passing uh, any legislator outside Chicago who would support that would soon become a former legislator. The only, the, the only response I would have to that is that legislators have to understand if you're not from Chicago and you don't help Chicago, how can you expect when your downstate municipality is in equally difficult trouble with its police and fire pension fund that the state of Illinois is going to step in and help them? All right. Good response. Now. Rachel, <laughs> doing a little Jackie Leeson. Rachel, we have a whole slew of questions. <laughs> Basically, lengthy questions. I'm just going to read one of them, which summarizes pretty much what all of you have been wanting to ask Rachel, so we will go. This is from Phoebe Selden. Phoebe, where are you? Okay. Um, is that a Acacia Financial Group? Two basic questions. You ready? Question one, and I'm sure this is asked just for informational purposes, no accusations whatsoever. <laughs> How can Moody's justify a rating so many notches below its quantitative methodology? And two, how can Moody support downgrades based on speculation rather than actual facts and events? Just so you, <laughs> I'm making it up. <laughs> Um, so in terms of our quantitative methodology, our methodology is not quantitative. It's quantitative and qualitative. And it's not just a point in time analysis. We are also forward looking. So um, with respect to Chicago, if you just look at the numbers on the face of, of, of the, the, from the city's audited financial statements, you know, the, some of the key metrics look pretty strong. Um, however, when you um, do some of the analysis that we do in addition to those numbers, you'll see a, a, a more stressed picture than you might initially see. So, um, you know, with respect to pensions, you know, as I've said, the numbers are pretty, pretty significant. Um, when you look at the overlapping, and the, the debt and pension liabilities of overlapping entities, that's something that plays into our analysis that might not show up on our scorecard, which, by the way, is publicly available. When you look at the trajectory, the growth in the unfunded liabilities, and the growth in the debt, that is something that doesn't show up on our scorecard. So we're looking for, we're being forward looking. When you look at the legal protections that are afforded to pensions in Illinois, that's very different from a lot of other states. You know, it would be a different story if, you know, for example, Ohio. Ohio had, has um, local governments that have some pretty significant pension um, underfund, underfunded pensions, but they were able to achieve some reforms that allowed those um, pension liabilities to be reduced. In Illinois, I think the court spoke pretty clearly that um, benefit reductions are not permissible given the, the uh, pension protection clause in the Illinois Constitution. Um, and as far as our rating, um, you know, one thing that I wanted to point out is the BA1 rating is non-investment grade, but by saying that the city is BA1, we are by no means saying that we think the city is about to default or, or anything of that nature. If you look at, based on our study of municipal defaults, a BA rated credit has a, is, there's a 5% likelihood that that credit will default in the next three years. So 5%, that's a pretty low probability of default. And so I just wanted to make sure that that point was raised. Um, you know, definitely we have a negative outlook, so we do see a, a possibility that the rating could move further down the scale, and that will depend on um, the outcome of a few key events that we'll be watching going forward. 
Um, one of those events is what will happen with the municipal labor statute if that is overturned as we expect it could be. The second thing is how that opinion would be expressed. You know, might there be some sort of um, path to reform that the justices could offer in their decision? If the municipal and labor statute is upheld, how will the city pay for that? You know, we've heard about next year, 2016, and the 911 surcharge, but what about all of the payments that will be coming beyond 2016? And then finally, we'll be looking at police and fire. That's something that um, we'll be watching very closely. The city has to increase that payment by quite a bit next year, and the budget for 2016 will be coming out at the end of this year. So we'll be looking to see how the city incorporates that payment going forward. Um, if the city is able to make um, their increased pension contributions that we expect that they will have to make, and they're able to do that in the context of a balanced operating budget that does not rely on non-recurring revenue streams, that could be something that would lead us to um, could lead us to um, either move the rating up or revise the outlook to stable. If the city um, is not able to accommodate increased pension costs, then that could be something that would warrant further rating movement downward. Okay. Can I just jump in here? Sure, just, but yeah, go ahead. With the point, uh, <coughs> excuse me. You know, I think it's a great question uh, because it, or at least as you know, as it raises a point that uh, needs to be talked about. So while. Well, Rachel and I may disagree about what um, Chicago's rating should be. I think it's important that that there's a, a broad understanding that uh, action needs to be taken, right? And that the the comparison to uh, to a New York, you know, is is appropriate in a sense, um, but um, inappropriate in others because New York's financial crisis and its fiscal crisis was much worse. Uh, that w when the community there, the business community, finally got involved and finally took extraordinary action the city's liquidity was really on a razor's edge um, and, and was very close to, uh, to uh, losing its uh, solvency. Cities are creatures of cash flow, right? They're not so much about assets and liabilities, they're more about revenues and expenditures, and that, those, those were not matching in New York for a long time uh, and caused a problem. So, you know, I think, I mean, post Moody's downgrade, I mean, I mean, I have been doing a lot of talking about it, um, but, you know, I've been talking a lot uh, to my um, clients and, and uh, subscribers, and, you know, uh, for uh, the people in uh, who are based in Chicago, uh, there's been a lot of you know jumping to the defense of the city and saying you know it's really not that bad. It's actually a great economy. You know, which is which is charming, really, right? That people would jump to their defense of the city, um, which you know, like, but 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 on the other hand, you know, you you don't want to be where New York was uh, before they had their solution. So, it's it's critical to get involved now and to make those adjustments now so that it doesn't get to that stage where you need um, a Dick Ravitch at all um, coming in and fixing thing at a, you know, on that, and that, on that wire, you know, that last wire gasp or whatever uh, I say. So by the way, from, if my memory serves me right, wasn't the te didn't the teachers union of New York bail out the city? I think, didn't, didn't they, they do? Something? All the unions. All the unions, Don? All right. What a way to get out of this, have the Karen Lewis <laughs> bail out the city of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Ponder there. Okay, now we have one more quick question for you, Rachel. We'll give a very short answer because okay. we have a lot of questions and I want to get off this. But this is from uh, Teresa Mattel, who's now the head of the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce. Uh, for her number two question Why did you downgrade the park district when it doesn't have financial problems and the pension is funded? So um, we believe that the city's revenue needs are so pronounced or expenditure reductions that the city will need to make, those are so pronounced in any scenario, whether or not current statute stands or current statutes are overturned. We put out a piece on May 1st that talks about, the, it's, it was called Tough Choices Now or Tougher Choices Later. Whatever happens with the municipal and laborer and police and fire pension statutes, the city is going to need to make some very difficult choices with respect to revenue and spending. And as such, we think that the Park District, um, it is appointed, the mayor appoints the board of the Park District, subject to city council approval. And we think it's, it's only, uh, any rational decision maker would say, all right, we're going to need to raise revenues on the city side to pay for the city's pensions. Therefore, perhaps we should moderate um, other charges and services against this tax base. Um, in order to mitigate the overall impact that a Chicago property taxpayer will need to pay. So that's the answer. I think um, 
you know, we certainly recognize that the park district has um, its own strengths, um, you know, that the liquidity is, is very strong. But, you know, we do think that there could be some vulnerability there. Um, and it's nothing, you know, nothing that, that we think um, is, again, it's, it's, it's what a rational decision maker would do when deciding how the, this tax base, this single tax base can absorb um, these costs that are uh, coming up. Okay. Um, one more step in by the moderator, and then we're going to you, uh, uh, Lawrence. Um, all this analytics stuff, um, do you do it differently than the other two credit, uh, credit agencies? Because you're, you seem to be in the lead in uh, knocking us down. <laughs> I can't speak to the other rating agencies' uh, methodology. But you, you use different, is it secret? I mean, is that like? No, no, as I mentioned earlier, our methodologies are publicly available. They're published on our website. If you have difficulty locating it, please um, send me an email and I can send them to you. Um, for okay. the other rating agencies, um, you would have to ask them. Great. Steve Schlickman, UIC, Transfer, Urban Transportation Center. This is for you, Lawrence. The Chicago Infrastructure Trust Fund was announced with great fanfare, but has not produced much. Does it still have potential? Yes. I um, just recently met with uh, Mr. Beitler, who heads up the trust fund. They have, they have several projects that are right now proceeding. They have plans for additional um, projects. So the infrastructure trust very much um, has potential. It's not going to be a, it's not a panacea for the city's overall infrastructure or other needs, but it's showing great progress and great promise. And uh, yeah, with, from our staff perspective at the Civic Federation, there it's so interesting that we invited them to address our board next week. I think is when he's coming in. Okay. Uh, normally we always put person's name, right, Jay? But this is a really sandbag, sarcastic question, which of course immediately attracts the moderator. Uh, <laughs> anyone could jump in, and uh, all city employees or former city employees at the high level, just relax. <laughs> If Chicago wasn't good at running a parking lot, how well will it run a casino? <laughs> That's a great question, and I'm just shocked that you wouldn't put your name to it. Go ahead. I think one of the things about casinos that all of us need to understand, and which I try to convey to the legislature and to the city council and others, is that you know, the, it's that siren song that someone else is going to be taxed or pay for something. And you've heard from Rachel and you've heard from Matt in terms of what the city needs to do. It needs to do a combination of cut and um, raise revenue. And that's politically unattractive. And it's politically unattractive because the elected official is going to be held accountable for it. People are going to notice when their property taxes go up. If you took all 10 casinos in the state of Illinois and the 20,000 gaming stations that the state legislature has made available throughout our, our state, together they generate $500 million to the state of Illinois in tax revenue. You've heard today about how big the problem is in the city of Chicago. It's not that casinos, a casino, if we knew where it was going to be located, if we knew who was going to own it, if we knew who was going to operate it, how it would fit in, um, we could make a, um, a, we could have some understanding of how it could be a part of a solution. But unto itself, even the biggest casino that, that people can promote is not enough to address the city of Chicago's um, financial challenges and the, other issue is for the state of Illinois, which is also in very bad financial shape, it's going to take revenue unless somebody has some secret as to how you're not going to see the um, um, gamblers go from the existing casinos over to Chicago. There will be some that won't, won't go to Indiana, but what we've seen in the past, River is the most successful casino um, in the state. It has We've seen, a, since that opened, a decline in revenue and attendance at the other casinos. And that, you know, casinos, this is an increasingly volatile business that is, you know, for all intents and purposes, shrinking. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Atlantic City and walked the length of the boardwalk uh, and walked past the three shuttered casinos that are there, and it's grim. Um, I mean, the rest of the boardwalk is great. Um, you should go. Uh, but, but, but those three 
casinos specifically, uh, you know, are, and they're enormous, enormous buildings uh, that are just dark. So it is not necessarily, you know, while it may provide some revenue here and there, you know, from a certain population who's going to go and spend their paychecks, it is not necessarily the, the dependable revenue uh, um, provider uh, that people would like. Okay, before we have a two minute closing from each, and because uh, Beth Coolidge wrote, with the smallest print in the history of the City Club of Chicago, questions that uh, uh, an, MPA, uh, an MPA final exam would find challenging, and she's on your board, right, uh, Lawrence? Yes, she is. All right. Well, Beth, I'm just going to ask the first part of the first question, if that's okay, because it's a hot button question. Uh, well, the moderator spoke too much. Here we go. Anyone, just a, like in a game show, this is a toss up. Uh, the city of Chicago enjoys a, well, a lower property tax than many of the suburban counterparts. There have been studies which indicate that if the city of Chicago choose to add the entire pension liability uh, of the city and the, well, let's just say, Beth, no disrespect, let me edit. Can, politically, is it possible for Chicago to make the argument that suburban, especially suburbanites with good schools, pay an enormous property tax rate to their schools, that Chicago could, do the, could raise the property tax and base it on the fact that in Chicago, it's much lower property tax than in the suburbs? Don't, don't be afraid. Jump in. I would certainly, when you look at the, the rate for residential property taxes in Chicago and what the average household in, each, in the Civic Federation does studies that compares communities across the collar counties, including Cook, um, what the tax, what the average tax bill would be um, and what, what that burden is, you see that on the residential side, Chicago taxpayers pay less com to comparable um, properties in other cities. But some of that has to do with sort of with the strength of the uh, commercial and industrial. We do pay, but the commercial um, cost for property taxpayers is very significant in Chicago because of something called the classification system and we tax at a different rate. But there is some, clearly some um, room for the city if it chose when it will need to choose fairly quickly how it's going to get enough revenue to pay for its government and pay for its pensions, that the property taxes are one of the places that all local governments look to, and they look to it already. The problem is that if you raise the property taxes so fast and so high that it drives businesses and people out of your city, then it will have a diminishing um, impact. You will have less of a base to tax from. That's the delicate balance that I believe Mayor Emanuel needs to continue to craft. And he has said he offered a property tax increase basically when it, for the Municipal and Laborers Pension Fund, and it was the then Governor Quinn in the Illinois General Assembly in their wisdom that said, oh no, not property taxes, that would be politically unattractive. So why don't you have a 911 tax or something like that? Um, th those are the kind of tough, hard decisions that are gonna have to be made. And there is room in the property tax um, uh, base for some increase, but there's not enough room for all of the city's problems and all of the city's debt in all of the city's unfunded pension obligations. Okay. Well, let's, uh, we always like to break on time, but we'll go a little bit over time. Uh, Rachel, we, we start, uh, we, you were the th batting third on the first round. You could lead off uh, two minutes uh, on a positive note. Uh, I'm a, and, since, and since I had a relative on the Illinois Supreme Court, uh, that's not an option that they're gonna go on the limb and say, this is how you should do it. Uh, they didn't run for judge to, to legislate too much. So uh, I said I wouldn't do it, and I did. Disregard that comment. Okay, <laughs> Rachel, two minutes, positive. Sure, I would say um, I'd just end on the note of in our rating reports, we always say what could move the rating up and what could move the rating down. And so I'll focus on what could move the rating up or lead us to revise the outlook to stable. And I think there we'll, we'll be looking to see what the city does, whether or not current statutes stand. I think, um, you know, as we've discussed, the city as a home rule entity has broad ability to raise property taxes and sales taxes. Again, we don't recommend that they do anything like that, but we just say that they have the ability to do so. They also have expenditure reductions that they could make. We're not, we're not really sure to what extent that they can make those or will make those, but we think that there, is, there are some tools left that Chicago has available to um, reverse the trajectory that they're on. 
And so, um, you know, that's what we'll be looking at going forward. Whether, whatever the state does, um, that's, that's one thing. But we think that Chicago has some tools that will enable it to respond and, um, and reverse course, so. Thank you. Round of applause for Rachel. <laughs> Matt, two minutes positive. So, uh, and you can't use the word analytics. <laughs> Do I say that a lot, analytics? I just, I just met you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, no, I personally am um, much more positive about the city. You know, I feel that with, with, you know, with the wealth of uh, economic resources, um, with the very crowded population that uh, you all have, um, you know, not just in the loop, but um, but elsewhere around the city. You know, I think that that the that the resources are there, um, and for sure the 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 manpower and woman power to figure out a solution is there. Uh, it just needs to be done. Um, you know, obviously a 50% uh, increase in property taxes would be destabilizing, and I don't think anyone wants that. Um, but you know, legging into um, a, a a modest property tax increase in addition to other financial reforms uh, and um, you know in increased investment in social services and education, I think all of those uh, will build a better city because you don't want to go down the road that uh, New York was in. Round of applause for Matt. <laughs> Lawrence, as the great Tom Rosier used to say, bring us together. So the positive is that the we have a, a city, uh, a mayor, a city council, everyone is now aware of what the financial situation is and hopefully they will bring their best um, efforts to it. We, did, we need help from everyone, every stakeholder. As was pointed out in New York, the unions participated in saving them. It was the union pension funds that bought the debt, basically. Um, the unions have as much at stake as anyone in seeing the city succeed. Everyone has something at stake in seeing the city's finances improve and its credit rating improve because it affects the cost of borrowing. There are things that have to happen in Springfield to stabilize the state's finances, but it cannot be on the backs of the local governments. Chicago is not in this mess alone in terms of its pensions. There are over 600 police and fire pension funds in the state of Illinois that basically are a significant burden on the municipalities there. There needs to be a state action. The other area is really, um, when you look at Illinois and what makes us unique besides um, the beautiful lakefront and our transportation assets, it has been our investment in infrastructure and the quality of our schools but we have 6,998 units of government in Illinois. It shouldn't come as a surprise to people that that's an expensive way to run your operations, right? There's no other state in the country that has um, more than 3,500 units of government. So Pennsylvania, the second most, has less than half the units um, of government. There has to be some serious attempt, both at the city level, to start to do things differently. Consolidation, whether it's the pension funds, whether it's the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund being moved over to the state, or looking at our existing overlapping units of government. Why is it that we have so many separate units of government? What kind of savings could be driven by it? There has to be a willingness to look at things and an attempt to do things that maybe we had reasons we didn't want to change, but now we have to change. A great round of applause for all our panelists. <laughs>